Hey everybody, why do I start out every one of these videos saying, hey everybody, I have no idea. Okay, so now we're gonna go over chapter 12, which is sculpture, another fine arts medium. Only sculpture is a three-dimensional medium, where it's drawing, printmaking, photography, painting, those are all two-dimensional mediums. So sculptures are three-dimensional objects possessing height, width, and depth, and they also possess volume and mass. Not the illusion of it, but actual volume and mass. So the earliest known sculpture is the Lovenminch or the Lion Man. So like when they found this, it was in a bunch of different pieces, like it was all broken up, and then somebody put it back together um they're like at this time in in europe and china and all parts of the world lions roamed around everywhere and people we believe really revered them because um they were scary and also very powerful so um this was either used as an item of worship or maybe I like to think it was a kid's toy. Um, like maybe maybe it originally had one of its hands waving like the little lucky kitty. So we can view sculptures in three ways. As a relief in the round or as part of an environment or an installation, which we'll learn about later. So we're gonna talk about relief sculpture first. There's two different kinds of relief sculpture. One is bas relief and the other is hot relief. And we're gonna talk about bas relief first. So bas relief, like um, this is where, like in all relief sculpture, all relief sculptures are flat on the back. A lot of times they're attached to buildings. Um, the, and, and in bas relief, the image hasn't been carved very deeply and it only projects a little bit off the surface. So bas relief are carved and carved carvings, this is a subtracted process where you like get rid of everything that you don't want to show in order to reveal the sculpture. It doesn't like um, carving does not not only relate to bas relief, but right now, it can relate to sculpture in the round. It can relate to sculptures part of an environment or an installation. But right now we're just talking about bas relief. So we're gonna talk about this really ancient bas relief sculpture that was originally part of a temple, the White Chapel Temple. And then later that temple was taken apart. And then it was like, this was installed in, in another building or edifice and then later on that was taken apart and this white chapel was reassembled in during the 20th century so this particular piece is sinus ret or sin wolves ret the first led by adam to amin ra so this is sinus ret this is autumn and this is amin ra Sin Reset, he's the, um, he's the leader of Egypt to uh, the Pharaoh, the king, who united the upper and lower Nile into one country. He didn't do it, you know, like peaceably, he did it really pretty violently. Um, the, the temple where this was found is a white chapel temple and it so it was used for a festival that commemorated the 30th year of Sinmur Threat's reign and um and then later on it held this funeral bark or a boat so when it was used in the festival they found evidence that there were places for two thrones in there but the two thrones where the pharaoh the king and his his wife sat they they found evidence that there were um like coverings that went around them 
so people couldn't see them. Um, they were sheer coverings because the the Pharaoh and the, and his wife they were considered gods. Um, and then later on, when it, where it says where it held a funeral bark or a boat, um, so what happened was they believed that after the the Pharaoh or the nobility were buried, that they would ascend up the pyramid into the heavens and that one of their souls like every day went in this boat and it went like fall of the sun and then every night it came back in again so they would have this this, this boat in there in the event that they needed to use it to ascend into heaven and go around the sun so um this guy right here this is him in real life he had arms and legs so his um he's the great grandfather of Amen Nimhat the third and Amen Nimhat the third is the person that dismantled the white chapel and then he took all those pieces all those relief sculptures and and built this third pylon of Karnak and then um archaeologists found all this stuff and I don't know how they knew to what went where but they reassembled that white chapel so let's look at this piece so again this is he's like uh sin rosette is has reunited not reunited he's united the upper and lower nile and he look 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 how violent this guy is he who united the foreign lands with the two arms who slaughters the bowmen without a blow of a weapon who fires the arrow without the sting being drawn, he whose dread has smitten the nomads in their land, he whose fear slaughters the nine bows, whose massacre causes the death of thousands of bear men who had dared to reach his border. So he does this, he unites them really violently. And um, we're gonna talk about these two gods. So. This god right here, this is in reverse. This is Autumn, and he's holding the Ankh, and the Ankh is the breath of light, and it represents the immortality of the god or the Pharaoh. Autumn's the father of the gods and the setting sun. He's, he's kind of like, a, I guess, Krishna, where he's a creator and a destroyer. He punishes evildoers. He protects the good. He gives them the, the good safe passage to the underworld. And I love this story. So, you know, a lot of times in these images, you'll see like a big eyeball. And um, this is um, like, here's the eyes right here. So these are the eyes of Autumn. So Autumn's father, Nun, was the spiritual waters and Autumn spit creates Shu, these are his two children, light and air, and Tefnut, moisture. And one time Shu and Tefnut go out into the mist and they get lost, and Autumn sends his eye to go look for them. You should, and if you, if you find this interesting, you should really watch Brother from Another Planet. Oh my God, I love that movie. Um, so then this other god, Amun, or Amun, is a hidden or unknown one. He's a god of creation and destruction. He completes and finishes all things. He's the ultimate and an alienable state of perfection. And Amin created himself and his the other gods with either his spit or his semen. And a lot of times you'll have the head because you're not supposed to see him. He's like mysterious. So he'll have the head of a crocodile or a frog or a monkey or a goose and when you like take Ra that's the sun and you merge him together with Amun Ra he becomes like the sun is visible Amun is invisible and so Amun Ra becomes both invisible and visible. Amun creates man and woman by copulating with himself and he's the protector of Egypt and the monarchy. 
And when the Pharaoh impregnates his wife, Amun-Ra goes into the Pharaoh so that the children that are born will be also gods. And like um, the words Amen and Iman, they both derive from the name of Amun Aman. So, like, so for a lot of years, like the Egyptians, they worship all sorts of different gods, many, many, many gods. But then when Akhenaten, he's the guy, he's the one pharaoh with the weirdly shaped head, uh, also known as Amenhotep the Fourth, decided that Amun Ra was the only god. And he destroyed like all the, like here's some of these statues that have been destroyed. He destroyed all these other statues of gods or he had somebody do this. And this really upset the citizens because just imagine like if you believe in something and you've been worshiping in this certain way for all your life and your parents have worshiped this way and your grandparents worshiped this way. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, no, you can't believe in this anymore. You'd be really upset. And people, people like there's accounts where people said this is the worst time in their entire life. And then once uh, Akhenaten died, then a lot of these other gods were, were restored. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the second kind of relief, which is, hot relief hot means high like you hear of hot couture like high fashion well this is hot relief and again it's flat on the back it figures or objects remain attached to the background plane but they project off of it really far at least half their normal depth um, and so we're going to talk about this one particular hot relief that has been kind of destroyed over time, which is Atlas brings Heracles the golden apples in the pre presence of Athena. And this is a hot relief that's on this temple of Olympia. So we over here know Heracles is Hercules. Uh, and so I'm gonna tell you the story about him. He's the son of Zeus and the mortal Alchemini, like Zeus is always going around and like hooking up with mortal women and um, and it just like pissed the hell out of his wife, like Hera. So Heracles was named Heracles, which means glorious gift of Hera, sort of as Alchemini's and Zeus's way of rubbing salt into the wound of Hera to make her like doubly angry. So she gets so mad about this that she delays the birth of Heracles, who was supposed to be like, it's like the next person that inherited the, this particular kingdom where he lived. But she delays his birth. So instead of him getting to be the king, his cousin, Erythesius, gets to be the king. And Heracles grows up, he gets married, has a bunch of kids, but Hera, she never gets over being angry. And she causes Heracles to go crazy, and he kills his wife and all his kids. So Heracles gets punished, like, like the, his cousin, let me look at his name again, Erethesius punishes him. And his punishment for killing his family is he has to like serve his cousin for 12 years and perform these 12 nearly impossible tasks. And we're going to talk about a couple of them. So one of these tasks was he had to clean the crap out of King Aegeus' stable. So King Aegeus had these giant cows. They were like the biggest cows you ever saw in your life. And they lived in the stable where they'd go, get to go out in the field, but they, they went to the bathroom constantly. And the, the, the stables was just full of crap. And so they said, okay, like other people tried to clean it, but, but like by the time they get a little bit done, then the cows would crap some more. And so they said, okay, Heracles, you have to go into the stables and clean out the crap. So the way he did it is like, so he opened the two ends of the stable. So the ends are open. And then 
he took a river on one side and pulled it over to one end of the stable. And then he took another river on the other end and pulled it into the other end of the stable. And then the opposing forces of water like washed out all the crap. Now, I don't know how long it stayed out, probably not very long, but at least momentarily, the entire stable was clean. So then there's another label, label, labor that that hot relief that we saw has to do with. And that he had to fetch the apples of the Hesperides. So there's this garden and in the garden is a tree and on the tree are these golden apples. And these, Hera gave these golden apples to Zeus when they got married. And these golden apples are sacred and they're protected. They're protected by the daughters of Atlas who are the Hesperides and the Hesperides are, I think one of them is dawn and one of them is dusk. So they have to do with the sun. And then one of them is just like red for some reason. And so they're guarded by them and as well as this multi-headed dragon known as Laden. And Laden has like a hundred heads and there's eyes on all the heads. And like at any one time, like at least some of the heads are awake. So they're constantly guarding this garden, which is hard to say. So Heracles, he's got to go find the garden, but nobody knows where it is. And he's like, he's like going around asking people, he's going to Lebanon, he's going to Syria, he's going to Palestine, he's like all over the place. And he constantly is like, people are always like, I gotta attack Heracles. So he like, he like gets in a fight with Nereseus, the sea god, and Nereseus like constantly is like changing from like fire to water to terrain. So he's like really slippery and hard to get. Then he gets in a fight with Antaeus, who's the son of Poseidon. And Antaeus, like, he, like, he can't be defeated normally unless you're able to lift his feet off the ground. And then he becomes suddenly weak. So Heracles, like, he lifts him off the ground and he defeats him. And then, like, when he's bad, finally, somehow he defeats Nereus and he goes, where's where's that garden? And Nerissa says, well, I don't really know where the garden is, but I know somebody who knows where the garden is. And he says, Prometheus knows where the garden is. So Heracles, he like finds out that Prometheus has been also punished because he stole fire from the gods. And the way he's punished is that he's like chained to this rock out at sea and every night an eagle comes down and eats his liver and then, or no, that's every day. And then every night it grows back. And then every day the eagle comes back again and eats his liver again. And it just goes on forever and ever. And then Heracles comes and he unchains Prometheus. Like fortunately he unchained him after his liver had a chance to grow back. Otherwise he'd be dead. So he says like, where is the garden? And he goes, well, I don't know where the garden is, but Atlas knows where the garden is because his daughters guard the garden. Um, so Heracles goes to Atlas. Atlas has also been punished. He's a Titan and a long time ago, the Titans and the Olympians battled and the Olympians won and then Titan like got punished and his punishment is the real punishment is he had to carry the sky but then somehow the myth got messed up and then it says oh he had to carry the sky and the earth so Heracles goes to him and he goes like I gotta get in that garden and I gotta get those apples and Atlas goes I tell you what you hold the earth in the sky and I'll go get that the apples look here's a Heracles, he's got his cell phone, it looks like. Anyway, so Atlas goes and he gets the apples. And Atlas is kind of an idiot, really. So he like gets the apples and then he goes back to Heracles and he goes, okay, ha ha, I got the apples and you have to hold the earth and the sky forever. 
and Heracles says, oh, I don't mind doing that, but my shoulders are kind of sore. Would you mind holding the earth while I put this pillow on my neck? And then Atlas, he's such a dummy. He goes, yeah, sure, I'll hold it. And then he, um, he takes the earth and then Heracles grabs the apples and runs off. And then he's like, has the apples and he's getting ready to give them to his uh, cousin. But then Athena says, oh man, you don't want to do that because if Hera finds out that you took those apples, you're going to be in worse trouble than ever. So the smartest thing is to go put them back on the tree, which he does, and everyone lives happily ever after. There you go. So Sculpture in the Rounds. Sculpture in the Rounds is a sculpture that you can walk around. Here's another sculpture in the round. Let me go back to this one. Luis Jimenez, like he lived in Hondo, New Mexico, but he would come to University of Houston once a week and teach the six hour sculpture class. People loved him so much that the, there was standing room only in the class. Um, but the sad thing is, is uh, Luis Jimenez designed this giant fiberglass horse, but while he was working on it, it fell on him in his studio and, and it killed him. It's really a sad story. Another one of my sad stories. Okay, so this, these Jeff Koons balloons, they're sculptures in the round. This is like, here's another Luis Jimenez. These are all sculptures that you can walk around and this is one of his preparatory drawings for that sculpture. Um, I don't know if anybody saw this ex exhibit. This was like a few years ago at the Museum of Fine Art, but this guy, Ron Uke, he used to work for Jim Henson and the Muppets, but he makes these giant sculptures that have hair and fingernails and they look so real. They're really like pretty frightening and you almost think they're moving when you see them. Um, but these are also sculptures in the round. I guess the Savage, she's this really famous um, sculptor, or as some people say, sculptress, but she's a sculptor. She's a civil rights activist. She was a leading artist during the Harlem Renaissance. And she like, um, she, this is one of her sculptures and it was like so well received that she got Urban League funding, two fellowships and money um, from her community paid for her to study in Paris, but and she got accepted at this academy in Paris. But then when they found out that she was black, she said, they said, well, no, you can't go. So she started a letter writing campaign where she wrote to all the newspapers. And even though the problem wasn't resolved, like, um, all this bad publicity against the place where she had applied the study in Paris, like it reflected badly on them. So she's the first black woman in the National Association of Women Painters and Sculptors. And she designed the sculpture for the World's Fair um, that is called Lift Every Voice and Sing. And it's based on a poem by a poet whose name I'm completely drawing a blank on right now. So it's a harp with the bodies of, of people singing as the, as the, like the bars and the strings on the harp. And um, the really sad thing about this is like, for some stupid reason, after the fair was over, the people at the fairgrounds destroyed her sculpture. So it only exists in photographs and postcards. So then there is sculpture as part of an environment. So sculpture as part of an environment, that would be a sculpture that was built specifically for an outside environment. And if you put it anywhere else, it's not gonna work. So it's site specific and site specific means the sculpture has been created for a specific location or environment. This was a, this is a site specific sculpture. You, you, most of y'all are probably too young to have ever seen this, 
but this was built um, out of, this was built at the Artley Houston on Montrose. The Artley Houston used to um, be in two old houses. And then the Art League raised a bunch of money to build a new building. And um, before they tore the houses down, Dan Havel and Dean Ruck converted the house into this sculpture called Inversion, where you could crawl through this hole into the backyard. And thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people saw it every day. So there's four main ways to make sculpture. There's carving, modeling, casting, and assemblage. Carving, we talked about that before. That's when you subtract or you move materials um, to reveal the sculpture. This is a cost sculpture. This is Minkari and Kamen Renepti. Um, he was a pharaoh. She was his pharaoh S. And it's made out of the super hard stone called gray whack. It's a hard, like it's an incredibly hard stone. And the reason why they use this hard stone is because this sculpture is where one of the souls of the pharaoh and the pharaoh's wife went for eternity. So the sculpture had to last forever, so that their ka, that soul, would have a place to live. Another carved kind of sculpture is known as a koros and that's um a, means noble boy or youth and these were in greece and they also rome um they use them as commemorative tombstones and they were also memorials for victory in sports they were offerings to the gods and they were also thought to represent apollo and these were made out of marble limestone or wood and then also cast in bronze. There's very few of these sculptures cast in bronze because they would recast the bronze into another sculpture or they would cast the bronze into something else. So most of those cast in bronze have been melted away. The reason they don't have any clothes on is because the, um, the Greeks believed that gods were perfect and that there, uh, they, there were no need for clothes and they had these perfect bodies. But all those athletes ran around with nothing on and seriously at first, soldiers did too. Um, so like the, in Greece, in Greek, pardon me, the female equivalent of a koros is a quarry. And um, originally these and these other sculptures were painted. So now there's modeling. Modeling is you're shaping a form in some plastic material, such as clay or plaster. And plastic, I'm not talking about plastic like toys are made out. I'm talking about the um, burr plastic, which means it's capable of being molded. So when you model something, you add, and sometimes you take away materials. When you make a clay object, I don't know if any of y'all ever worked in clay, you have to, the clay objects have to be hollow inside. You also have to pound the clay to get all the air bubbles out of it because you're gonna, you're gonna fire them in a kiln and a kiln has, um, and the clay needs to have relatively thin walls so that when it, before you fire it and you allow it to dry, it dries all the way through. If it was solid, it may not dry and then you put it in that hot kiln and it's gonna blow up otherwise. I'm not gonna go into the Terracotta Warriors um, because it's in the chapter and I don't wanna go on and on and on in this, in this uh, recording that you're gonna have to listen to. Um, what, which by the way, like these warriors, like uh, in this tomb of um, Quen Shi Huan, they were also originally painted and each one of them is individualized um, and they all look different. So, the, but they faded over time. They were pretty cool. They, you know, in, included um, everything that the king needed in the afterlife. It's just like the Egyptians. Um, so, 
anyway, there's, there's that. Let's go on to casting. There's also a video on casting, so I'm not going to go into great detail on this, um, but casting is a process in which the sculpture is cast in some liquid material that hardens and cools, such as metal or plastic. So um, some of the, like, the, the people that made the most amazing, beautiful bronze sculptures were in the kingdom of Benin, uh, which is on the, I believe, west coast of Africa. And they perfected this process known as the lost wax process. So the lost wax process steps, and the videos on this as well, is there's a clay model. First, you make a clay model with thin walls, and then you cover it in a thin coat of wax. Then you make a mold of the original, like um, back in the day, it was made out of clay or plaster. Now these are made out of rubber. And from this mold is made a hollow wax cast. Then this is covered in another layer of clay. And you have to have these channels because these channels are when you pour the bronze or whatever in there, those wax channels are gonna melt out and and this is going to melt out as well and um and be filled full of that bronze then it's then it's fired in the kiln and then the hot bronze is poured into it and then it's allowed to cool and then all of these things here these channels have to be knocked off and then it has to be polished and then it has to be cleaned up um so in benin they would make these bronze sculpture casts of the king or the oba's head. They would also have bodies. They would have a wooden body. The body would be clothed. And when the oba, or the king, died, the um, the son would have this this oba head and body made of his father, and it was meant to represent the king. And these these all resided like all the past obas. These replicas of them resided in the palace in Edo, Benin. And then when the British invaded Benin and they overthrew the um, Oba in 1897, they plundered the city of Edo and they, they stole all of the, the Oba statues and all the, other, all the other bronze and gold and whatever items that were there they just like there's elephant tusks they just stole everything and the oba was placed in chains and he was exiled here's some of these oba heads they're beautiful they're so beautiful they're amazing here's some more of them okay so assemblage and this is what you're going to make an assemblage sculpture so an assemblage is a sculpture made from various materials such as found objects paper wood and textiles this is uh, David Hammond. He's like really famous for making assemblage sculptures. He did this assemblage installation called Orange is the New Black. And like, you know, like the main character of that show is uh, a white woman. And then there's like all these other prisoners in the show. And um, so, but it's also referring to the high population of people of color that are in prison and also like the prison system which is just an extension of slavery a lot of times because like people will be thrown in prison for really minor offenses and then they have to like work on these prison farms and stuff so this is actually an Nkizi and Conde sculpture from Africa that he's, he's painted orange, and then this is a painting that he's covered in this orange cloth. Um, here's another one, it's called Night Train, and um, it's a kind of a play on words. One, it resembles the, like, the train and the coal and the um, railroad system, but it also resembles, um, I mean, it resembles. It also, all these bottles are this liquor, cheap liquor called Night Train. And when I lived in Baltimore, um, I think David Hammond might be from Baltimore. There's a liquor store on every single corner 
and they sell this really super cheap rock gut liquor there, which I'm assuming Night Train is one of them. Uh, this is another one in the hood. This is made way before Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, and, and it's just simply a hood, but it's ominous and sad and, and scary at the same time. This is somebody from Houston, Kathy Hall. I went to school with her. I love her work. Um, she's a friend of mine. She made this Dada shoe, which is made out of a pipe and a clarinet mouth mouthpiece. This is called Strike, and it's a snake made out of matches. And this last one's called Sardines. It's a sardine can with cigarettes that are been like there. There's epoxy in this, and they've been placed in the sardine can. And many, many years ago, I went to a party at this art collector's house. His first name is Frank. I forgot his last name. It was a pretty wild party back in the day. And this was like the sculpture was sitting out on the counter. And the next day, the maid came to clean his apartment. And she was like, God, those people are trashy. They put all their cigarettes out in there. And she threw away the sculpture. So it is lost forever. And then finally, we're going to talk about Robert Rauschenberg and his combines, which are a combination of a, um, of, of a symbolage, a painting and sculpture, and often printmaking. Robert Rauschenberg's from Beaumont, Texas, and he moved to New York, became really famous, and he was just doing regular paintings. But then he saw this um, ram in an antique store resale shop and he asked the guy how much it was and the guy said $35 and Rauschenberg only had like about, I don't know, like $10. He said, let me pay you this down and I'll pay you the rest later. And then he was like, I'm gonna put this, like figure out how to put this into a painting. So he tried all these different ways, like maybe I'll put it like this. Maybe I'll put it like this on the painting just trying out all this different stuff. And then ultimately he decided to put it down like this on top of the painting where the painting is like a field that is on. And then he, there's a, a painted tennis ball back here. I suppose that's supposed to resemble, you know, what the, what the goat did after it ate. So there you go. That's the end of our sculpture chapter. And I'll do a couple more recordings on architecture and then we'll be done. Yay.